Welcome back to Channel Water. Today we're going to talk about our existence, human beings. Why human beings? What makes us different from the rest of nature? How come we are part of one evolutionary tree? We know we're part of nature, yet we feel a certain disconnect. There's something that we know is different. So when talking about existence and purpose, there's two different questions. Today we're just going to focus about the human vehicle, the human being. But in a different video we'll talk about existence in general. Why is there something instead of nothing? So first we got to start with understanding this vehicle, why we are part of nature, part of the evolutionary tree, yet we're disconnected. We know that there's something different between human beings to plants, animals, the environment around us. If you follow the logic of our channel, that water is the body of consciousness, and nature is architecture, it's buildings, vessels of consciousness. So we know that plants, animals, they're architecture, where water dwells, where consciousness actually dwells in. They're buildings to house water, and consciousness itself, in its ideal temperature, in its ideal connectivity, as they live in singularity in a sense. So plants and animals, they don't ask those questions of why and where. They just are. They're just being. Just like your house doesn't ask a question, it just provides you the home that you're in. But when it comes to human beings, we have a different paradigm altogether. We see that both in our actions, in our relationships to nature, we're doing something different. We're behaving more like the way water treats matter. You can see that human beings are the scientists. We manipulate matter. We categorize matter. We manipulate. We are architects. So we're a building that is building buildings, if you see what I mean. Plants are the building. Animals are the building. They do nest, they do provide for themselves certain environments, but we are building a completely new system, a completely new scale in which water lives. So when we look at evolution from a point of view of single cells and water, we see that we get different collages of architecture, different structures, different types of buildings. And they all manifest themselves in the different plants and animals and ways of existence. And then comes the human being. Suddenly we have a new cell. The human being or the single family home is the new single cell. And now we start building new collages of buildings, of architecture, of way of existence. And it seems that it's agreed that human beings are going to be the vessels that hold water in those systems, but then the architecture around us is what evolves. So for many people, we have a misconception that evolution is evolution of consciousness, evolution of the mind, that we went from being not very smart to smart, or that the brain grew and we gained more consciousness by that. But the reality is that the evolution is evolution of architecture, of technology, structures, use of materials, of our sciences. But consciousness is the same, remains the same. And more than that, it has a fractal structure, meaning in every scale, it's not less intelligent or not as smart, it just has different functions. So until now, single cells were of the building blocks of consciousness, the single family homes, the units, the cells in which consciousness fractal itself down to. So it's like pixels on a screen. And now what we see is that there's a scale up where human beings are the new cells. We're the new pixels. Each one of us holds hundreds of trillions of cells and now we're scaled up. And the architecture around us scales up too. So for that reason, we are architects. We are building new structures, technologies. We're scaling up everything that is in our body. 
you can see the body as a master plan for the future in that sense. So plants and animals are homes. They are the house itself for consciousness and for water. And those homes are earthbound. They're not, they don't have the ability to leave this planet. So they work perfectly fine on this planet. And they have infinite amount of expressions and structures and they're all connected. They are actually on the same network. They are all connected and they feed off of the same information which we feel disconnected from. We know we're disconnected from. Unlike most animals and plants which can communicate with each other and they're just are, they're being, they're just living in that singularity together within one system, we cannot listen, we cannot hear what they're talking about, the information that they have. And what we find is that we are like astronauts. We are outside of that system, building a new system, a larger system. And that goes back to the fractal nature of scaling up. So we're going to have the same thing, just bigger. And that's the nature of a spiral, is that every section is exactly the same in its shape, geometry, but bigger, scaling up and scaling up. So we can use our body as a master plan to know what we're scaling up towards. And even now you can see that our society, from the government to organizations to the world we live in, is not that different from the brain, organs, and the world inside of us. So you can see in nature how single cells have reached a certain size and from that size they didn't grow further, they just multiply. And as they multiply they created infinite amount of structures, plants, animals, insects that you know we don't have enough time to even find all of them. But the cells themselves remain of the same scale, more or less, and we get different collages and different designs of architecture of those cells. So if we use a humans, for example, you will have anything from regular houses to high-rises to a cruise ship to an airplane to submarine. You'll have a lot of different types of collages of a way that a person can live as a single family home or a unit of one person inside of architecture. So now we can see how human beings are the larger scale of those cells, since as big as one can be, a person, it's the same variation from a single cell. A single cell can be maybe bigger, smaller, but really they are of the same size. And they don't grow further and further and further. Um, they can just collage more and more and more. And we could see that, you know, we got to the dinosaurs and that was the biggest and um, it was even too big that it failed. And if we look at it in the larger scale of things, it's not a sustainable way of being. So then nature scales back down and created human beings. And we are the flagship for single cells to continue forward, to move on within life in the universe. So for example, when you see a man in a space station, or landing on the moon, you actually see the successful mission of single cells leaving the planet, leaving out in the space station or on the moon. I don't see it as men reach the moon, it's single cells that had a successful spaceship that they designed to leave this planet and to get the space stations to the moon and further on. So the size, the scale, the technology, it was all successful. Single cells have made it out to space, has, have made it out to the moon. And we don't even know how we will evolve further to be in those conditions, in that state. Uh, we might be even smaller, different. In that sense, it's not really about the human vehicle as it is an evolving vehicle to serve single cells as they move out and further to the universe. So we say that consciousness is a fractal. You can imagine a spiral. It is actually the source of all spirals, of all fractals, of that movement from zero to infinity. 
of scaling up and being completely independent of that. And that's when you can understand how a plant, an animal, an insect, they all carry the same consciousness and that level of the mind, the thought. They're just in different vehicles and different architecture that allows them for different functions, which we can look at as intelligence or ability. But that's really, it's just the limitations of their technology and what they were designed to do. But consciousness itself is not limited at all as far as scale. And we know that from human beings, doesn't matter your size, that's not gonna tell us how smart or not you are. So while consciousness is not limited to size, matter is. Matter itself has very limited form and we analyze it, break it down to the smallest form. We build things from the ground up, from the smallest size up. So you can see how we're building things from the smallest scale possible with the smallest particles we can find and that's our limit on that end of things. And then we scale up our structures using those blocks, using those small structures, building them up, building them up, until we get a redwood tree, a dinosaur. But when you look inside the, the scale of the structures, are they all start from the single cells, they all start from that scale in building the bone and building the body. And then, if you really want to understand that, you can look at the architecture that we're building. So we start from rocks, that we find to breaking them down to fine dust that we can then combine together into concrete metal structures and when we build you can see how structural engineering is the key for our building for the size we get how big we can get and if there wasn't any limitation limitation of size we would just build as big as possible or as small as possible so the limitations of matter is what we're working within and what we're counting on. So you can see how in the past people have tested it out. What's the biggest thing we can build up to a pyramid, a big wall in China, or uh, how much stone can we pile in one bunch so we can make our own mountain. And today you see from metal and glass we build high rises and uh, the biggest airplanes, the biggest ships. We just scale up as far as we can go within the limitations of matter before it starts breaking down and failing on us. So we always test that and find the furthest we can push it. And also at the same time, you see how we constantly look in and trying to find the smallest building blocks we can work with. Because that's where it starts. If we work in nanoscale and we build things to, to a place where materials are bulletproof, or they have certain abilities that you couldn't even imagine. So we as consciousness take matter, break it down to the smallest scale, build it up back to the biggest scale we can use it, and create structures in all of those forms, all of those scales. But you can see in our architecture, the cells inside of that architecture is still a human being. It's always the same cell with more or less the same intelligence, if you put it on an average. Consciousness itself, we are completely boundless as far as form. We are free form, we're independent of scale, and you can see that in our, um, let's say if we make a computer-generated images of fractals, it's a good example of seeing that. We can just zoom in infinitely or out infinitely. Um, or if you meditate and you get to that state, you can see that, that in that sense, the mathematics within consciousness is infinite. It really has no scale. It can flow completely to any one direction until we meet matter. And like we said, that's where we meet limitation. That's where we have something that we have to use in a certain way, in a certain size and scale in order to work with it. And we, as body of water, we're trying to create sustainable structures and systems that will eventually be closed systems of water that will work completely independently on this planet and in space. 
A good example of the fractal nature of consciousness, each one of our bodies. When you look at your body as a society that has a government, the brain that is split into left and right, organs, organizations that have completely different functions and they keep this whole body working. And then we have all the single cells, all the cells that are from the working class to the actual cells that experience the life that are conscious. This whole body is conscious, not just the government. So if you compare that to a nation, and then each person you see is a parallel universe to the next, because our bodies are hundreds of trillion cells, when in the world we only have a few billion people. So the complexity of the technology within our bodies is far more complex than what we know in the scale of humans. So we are very young still in that sense, in our structure. And you can see that we're just in a universal scale, more of a bacteria that is just slowly sending spores out to space uh, with our satellite space station and touching the moon. But we're just beginning to start hatching out from this planet. So even though we are on Earth right now, to the nature around us, we are already astronauts. We are already outside of the system, the unified system, the singularity of nature that all the plants and animals share. And we know that, we feel that. And it's really an odd feeling. It makes us feel sometimes sense of we don't belong or that man is completely different or um, disconnected, bad, good, all kind of different strange ideas we get from that disconnect that we have from the environment around us. But that's because we are astronauts. We are the spaceship. We are the evacuation plan for water from this planet. We are made for that purpose. And we see that. We see that we are actually recreating the networks of singularity in nature below us in a bigger scale above us. And then we have that feeling or that vision that we will end up in a place of singularity, that we will end up in a place where we are all connected fully and back to that experience of being one. So it's possible that we are the evacuation plan for this planet. We are the way that water can travel out of this planet. That this is an egg, in a sense, that we're hatching out from. We see that all the world around us is kind of inverted and encapsulated inside of us. Our body is really a map to everything that's around us, like a mirror in a smaller scale. For water, the goal is to be independent in space. Space is really the environment we live in not what we call the environment here. Here we're inside of the atmosphere and the ocean. We're inside of the body of consciousness itself. It is consciousness itself that is slowly hatching out to the universe, then finding other bodies of water on other planets, asteroids in space that are frozen. They're frozen in time. They're outside of the cycle. And for water, which is one of the things we research and will teach her further, for water there is a preference to be liquid, to be at a certain temperature. So while we understand that consciousness is everywhere and in everything, there is a physical side to that. There is a physical side to be in consciousness everywhere and everything. And it's not something that we determine, it's something that we can see from what's happening around us, what consciousness is doing, the structures that it is building in plants, animals and people. There is a preferred state. There is an evolution of technology and architecture that shows us where it's going, what is the, perf the perforation. So water didn't evolve to freeze itself up, it evolved to the, the opposite to be liquid, connected at a certain temperature. And that is what we have to 
keep in mind, we're here to protect water and to ensure water's independence in space. So you can see that we are made in the image of water, in the image of single cells as it scales up. We are architects, scientists, artists, creative, constructive, building, making, moving forward, moving out and away from the bigger body of consciousness, which is part of the feeling of the astronaut I was talking about. We are moving away outside of consciousness and then rebuilding a network for it to operate freely in space. So it's all good and ideal to be an ocean, to be a tree, but maybe there is an understanding on this planet, or maybe it is an egg that is hatching, and it's just a phase. This is the phase of building the vehicles and the technology that will allow it to hatch further and grow out to space. We know that there's an infinite space with infinite amount of water out there, so it makes sense that we are here to spread out and bring back all that water into a cycle and, and grow. That's what nature does. It grows. And in my research, what I found is that there's this, the movement of growth is basically a minimum amount of water controlling the maximum amount of matter. And we see that both in human nature, animal, and, and everything. So again, the minimum amount of water that can control the maximum amount of matter. And you can imagine, just like your body operates 100 trillion cells, one person, one technology of our body could operate an entire planet. So to understand the concept of the astronaut, imagine one of our astronauts now in a space station. They are disconnected from every conversation that happens here, from the field of sound, smell, vision that we all share. They're limited to the communications they can have with this planet and the things they can experience from here. And just like that one astronaut in a space station feels compared to the world here that you can just walk out and hear, see, smell, communicate, in the same way human beings are to nature, to plants, animals, the world of single cells. And we know that. We feel that. We are aware of that. And it's not an easy place to be in. It's not an easy thing to do. So we live in that separation, a temporary separation, until we recreate all those networks. We create a network for humanity to be fully connected in singularity. And that will be the state where, as humans, we'll be liquid again. That is what water's essence is, that connectivity between all those pixels of consciousness, which are at the same time, one ocean and infinite pixels. So we're creating that. And that will happen in space. That will happen everywhere. It doesn't matter where you'll be. You'll be part of that field of consciousness. You'll be connected to it. And we see that desire in our everyday life, in the technologies we make, the things we construct. It's all about communication, faster, and more in a way that we're completely on one field, completely immersed in it. So if you can imagine physically consciousness growing, expanding more and more space between each pixel, yet the connections are there. So as we spread out to space, become thinner and thinner in that sense of the distance between the particles of water, Yet we have those electric charges, those different fields of communication, and that field is growing. That's what growth is. So we'll see more space between the particles, yet more connectivity too. So not like air, which is fully dispersed, but doesn't have the connectivity, it doesn't have the ability to build and be functional. Water does. Water is that ideal state where it's both connective and constructive. And as we move out to space, we don't see it yet, but the vehicles will create for that. There are new creatures in this universe. Once you have 
a vehicle that is completely self-sustained, a closed system of water, which we are part of. There's no water coming in or going out. Nothing leaves that vehicle. That is a new creature. That's a new way of being out in the universe. And now we have this illusion that uh, I drink water going in, going out, but really you are inside of water. You're inside of the atmosphere. You're not separated from a bigger body of water. It just, there's a certain flow that happens through and that will continue to happen. So even if you're an astronaut walking on the moon, you're inside of a suit that provides you that atmosphere. So we have all those local atmospheres that we will operate in. And you'll have the same gradation of water and the atmosphere itself. So we'll have the same thing. We'll have water and what we call air inside of a vehicle where we are operating in. And again, we don't know what the evolution of that would be like. There might not be air at all. We might not even be standing and breathing. We might be fully connected to a technology around us. We just water flowing continuously. And we can find parallels right now between the structures we're sending out to space to the first insects and the first structures that started here on Earth outside of the ocean. So the movement of life was first outside of the ocean to the atmosphere. And we saw how those structures were very fragile. They didn't have, they weren't immersed in water. Suddenly they were immersed in air and had completely different physics to relate to. So they could be more fragile in that sense. Now we leave the atmosphere and the gravity. And now we have, again, much bigger scale structures, but they carry that same quality, kind of like insects. Our, the moon lander, all of our satellites, all of those things, they're actually very fragile. And they're operated to be sustainable in that environment that has no gravity or air. So in, in some sense, it's easier, but also harder, um, only because we have to leave the atmosphere and gravity on the way there. But it's interesting to see those parallels, and you can kind of map the map of evolution out of the ocean to the atmosphere and copy-paste that into another evolution out of the atmosphere out to space. We'll see the same things happening in a much larger scale. So if a jellyfish is in the ocean, water moving in water, here in the atmosphere, it will be kind of an inflatable balloon of air moving in air. And then in space, suddenly it switches again. There is importance in going out to space and bringing back to the cycle of consciousness frozen water. Water in a frozen state is not ideal. It is frozen in time. And we'll dedicate a whole video just for that. And we're actually getting a lot of questions about that. And for water, temperature is time. So you can be frozen in time, close to zero, almost no time is moving, to it's too hot, time is moving too fast, and you completely lose touch between the particles, and um, it's, it's, it's not functional again. So there's an ideal temperature with the, which water works inside of. And in that sense, we can call that time. So if you see your life as an individual human being, you look at the environment around you right now as the environment for life. But if you see yourself as the ocean and atmosphere, space is the environment for life. It's a very harsh environment for life, as we know it, for water to be liquid and fluid. So we have to scale up also our thinking and understanding of where we are and what is happening. Any embryo and egg in nature, it's actually a very short amount of time that life is in that phase. It's a very fragile phase and very limited. The embryo, the egg provides enough food and time for that life to hatch out to the hostile environment, which usually can consume that egg easily, and life will not even hatch further. So if we are in that state, we are in a very limited place with limited amount of time and resources to reach that point where we hatch out sustainably in a healthy way, 
where we are capable and able to continue on infinitely. Because we know any damages that happen to any embryo in its first stages will affect it to the rest of its life. So we are now in that stage. And that's why we see a lot of people rushing out, rushing to find those technologies and ways to hatch out of this planet, to Mars, to the moon, to space stations. It's not because they have some kind of a ego trip that this is what they're interested in. It's really the force of life and the growth of nature that wants to expand further out and find a way to survive in space, not just survive here in this environment, which is also changing and in a, in a sense that goes hand in hand. The environment here is changing maybe to a place where we will not be able to live here. Just like it happens in an egg, where the conditions are getting worse and worse and worse, resources are depleting, depleting, to a point where the embryo ate the last piece of food left, nutrition, in the egg, and then it hatches out. So hopefully we won't have that kind of a painful birth through crisis out to the rest of our life. Rather, we will do that in a far more calculated, sustainable, and comfortable way. It's possible that you are that spaceship. You are the first spaceship from the first man that walked on this Earth. It was already the beginning of that building of the spaceship that leaves this planet, that leaves out in space. It's possible that that was always the plan for us, as far as the growth of life, further out to space. Trees, plants, animals, they were, everything was totally fine on this planet. They were totally, there was no problem with that. But if the environment is changing, or will change, if an asteroid hits this planet, and maybe life on this planet would continue perfectly and beautifully as it is, while we have a plan B, a way out to the world, to make sure that we survive further. Or you can see that that's what life does. It's not that there's one cell and that cell lives forever happily. It splits itself and further and further and further. And as the cells keep splitting, we're growing. Consciousness is growing. More consciousness, more water, controlling more matter, building more architecture, expanding further out to space, that's all that nature does, is grow. That's the one movement we can see in nature, that movement forward, growing, expanding. More and more water in the cycle, more and more matter being used to give it a shelter, a vehicle, a house. And we can already see how that expansion happening as we used to build our homes with our own hands, now you can create an entire home on the computer and have it completely fabricated without ever touching anything with your hands. And if you look at a high-rise downtown made out of metal, glass, all those materials, you won't even see an evidence of a fingerprint of a hand ever touching anything. And that capability is only expanding further. And we, we'll have a good video, the next video is actually about that extension of our psyche into technology, our extension of our thought into matter. As many people claim that they can control matter just by using thought, um, we used to laugh at that. But now if you can read my brain waves and I sent an order to order something online, and the next day it shows up at my doorstep, I have done nothing physically. Yet I just sent a signal, and by my thought I manipulated matter, both to produce a product and get it all the way to me. So water itself, in a very small scale, can do that with manipulating matter, and now we can see how we're getting to that stage, where we're actually going to be able to do that, to manipulate matter without ever physically doing anything ourselves. Our bodies are the first transition between consciousness, thought, 
two matter and now we're gonna even bypass that and that's why we don't really know what the full evolution of the human body is yet what we will need to even keep from this vehicle as we move forward into space and into a place where thought is enough to completely manipulate, build, evolve, grow further out into the universe. So we can see how the source of thought and the movement is always going back to consciousness, to water, to a place of that is very abstract in that sense. It always goes back there. And from there it expands out further and further and becoming more capable and functional physically in the material world. And once you're fully connected into that system, yeah, in a sense you won't even know the difference between you, the conscious being, the water and matter. Then they'll be completely working together in that singularity matter. But now we can still see where the thought is coming through, through the water to matter. And that's going to continue rippling out and continue wiring itself into the world. Everything else is just an extension of that thought, an extension of consciousness into matter. So going back to understanding the human body in this equation, it's always good to look at cars, both the evolution of a car and how that vehicle relates to consciousness. So cars did not make themselves and we know that from the fir first log of wood that rolled down the hill that became the first wheel, from that moment on to a self-driving car, it's been one line continuously growing and we consciousness are always being the driver and the designer of the car. We're the ones operating the vehicle and we're designing it to be so intelligent in a sense, technologically, that it can drive itself, operate itself within a well-defined system. Cars don't need to be creative. They're not building or making, they're just operating, preventing accidents and just giving us functionality of getting from point A to point B. So the car itself will never be conscious and self-aware, even though it's aware of its environment and operates in the way that we designed it to operate. We designed how it will be aware of its environment. But at no moment the car will be able to look back and say, oh, I made myself, this is who I am, this is what I am. It is always a vehicle serving consciousness. For us human beings, we are a combination of the two, where we are consciousness operating a vehicle, it's consciousness communicating through this vehicle, but the vehicle is not consciousness, so the, the matter, the body, is not what you are. And the house, the extension, is not what you are. It's just layers and layers and layers of matter that are there both to protect you, to extend you, and to operate within the material world. It serves as that extension between, as a tool between me and the next thing I'll have a shovel or a hammer and then matter. So the, the vehicle is a temporary state that serves a very specific function. And in that sense, we can see that the human vehicle is both a vehicle and a home. It's both operated by consciousness, just like water does, to be creative, to build and move forward, grow, help nature grow. And not just like a plant or an animal, which are just houses. They are just there as a place for consciousness to dwell. So it's good to understand that we are young. We're just at the beginning of that journey. We can count how many people we sent to space, how many cells have actually left this place and came back. And the, in the future, we won't even come back. We're just gonna export out to space, grow out further. And there'll be a day where we might have to say goodbye to Mother Earth 
both physically and conceptually to that concept of earth is your mother rather um, it's mother water because if you find water in space or if you have babies in space then does that spaceship becomes your mother or the moon would you call it mother moon our mother is water and consciousness and we'll see as we expand out this space that our understanding of what matter is, those rocks that we find and use compared to who we are, who we really are. So now I want to get to a part that's really, I think what's the most important part and the part that's missing for most people in life right now, the meaning, purpose. There is truth within the architecture of life. From the point of view of humans, within the human story, our biology in a sense, we find that nothing matters, or life is, doesn't have a real purpose or a meaning. And it's easy to do that as we just dwell in our mind about mathematics and playing with words and scenarios to come to a conclusion where there's no truth, there's no real bad or good. But when you get to life itself, water, the body of consciousness, the preference that it has, the desire to be liquid, connected, not frozen in time or completely evaporated in space, then you start to find real truth. And we can see as nature grows, there is truth in the goodness of construction building life, supporting life, sustainable life. And there is the opposite, which is the destruction of life, avoiding that movement forward, avoiding the development of life to a place where it's completely independent in space. So as we get so involved and distracted in the human story, a lot of people get lost and they don't have the guidance to see that you are that purpose, you are that meaning, and your movement forward is serving that purpose and meaning, and there is truth in that. So everything we think of good and bad is a completely different paradigm when it comes to water and consciousness. We have a certain set of rules to how we should behave to each other, and what is good or bad socially, or as far as being a good citizen. But there's even deeper truth and deeper knowledge that people today don't have connection to because they're so immersed in the human story. So part of the purpose of this video is really to understand that movement of life forward and out into space, into the world, and not lose sight of that and not be so involved in your local immediate story and get depressed, feel that your life is meaningless, purposeless, just because you're not the next billionaire or haven't reached certain fame or certain dreams that you had as a human being. You are already that thing that you wanted to be. You already have the purpose and meaning in you. As consciousness, the soul is building a home in the universe through you, in you. You are that thing. The most precious part of life is in your hands, in you, and the way you treat yourself, others, participating in that movement forward, in the development of life, in the construction of life, creating rather than destroying, building, making moving forward in that sense together as one body this is the ocean and atmosphere in front of the emptiness of space that's how big your task is you are part of that the cold open empty space that has no life or time is waiting for you to bring that out there life and time all of that is in your hands 
and you're the one that's going to take it out to space, out to the universe. The spirit, consciousness, the soul, that abstract world that we are away from now, we are the guardians of that world. We are the astronauts outside of that world, taking care of it, making sure it continues, it's intact. We're serving a purpose in this vehicle, not knowing what that purpose is while we are outside. So it's very difficult, but one must see that, that you are an astronaut. You're outside taking care of something, and that something needs that care. It is in a very fragile environment that is not supportive. And we're building and creating an environment that will be completely independent in space and will have that ability to continue on free-flowing out to space, growing, expanding that consciousness out to space. So I know a lot of people won't understand what I'm talking about, but until you die, because then you go back and you realize where you came from and where you're going back to. But while we are here, we have a task to do, and it's a very important one. We are the guardians of consciousness, of the soul. We're the one building a home for it. We are architects, builders. We're making something in this material world that allows the spirit to dwell, live on, succeed. We can see that there are things that are not good for the spirit, for the soul, for consciousness in this physical world, be it ice or fire. We know that there's a place and there's a condition that is ideal and we're here to continue that, build on that. So it's in us and around us. So while it's in you, that's why we are taking care of this vehicle and multiplying these vehicles which are also homes for those cells. We're cells of consciousness, pixels of consciousness together building some kind of a bigger screen. You can't see the image yet or even the movie projected on it until it's fully built. So for each pixel in a TV screen, it's hard to understand at this point, what is that screen? What movie is going to be projected? Who's even making it? But you are all of those things at once. And you're part of a bigger network of pixels where one body one body of consciousness with infinite amount of experiences, each one of us. That's the beautiful duality that if you can hold in your head of both being this individual pixel, having this experience now, while you are part of a bigger body of consciousness that is one, just one thing. And that's how, the fr that's how fractal operates and what it allows to have that infinite one, and the infinite one, right? You as a one, the whole body is one, at the same time. So in the truth through water about life, I can give you a quick list of what full water would look as good and bad. Construction, destruction, home, homeless, connected, disconnected, in control, Helpless, warm, cold, liquid, ice, active, passive, light, dark, something, nothing, meaning, meaningless, Purpose, purposeless, good, bad. When it comes to water, to consciousness itself, you can actually find truth. There is truth. Anyone that tells you that there's no meaning, purpose, truth to you, 
that you're bad just by being a human that you didn't even design or made is trying to steal something from you and divert you from your true meaning and purpose of our true growth and how to independence. We have to hatch out of this egg and reach to independence in space as space is our true environment that will consume us unless we consume it. Once you follow this truth, you'll see that also everything that within the human story is considered as good as bad follows. You will not kill, hurt, or do anything to anyone else that is a destruction of the architecture, that hurts mentally or physically the architecture of life. You will see that everything else follows. So you can either follow it through the human story, through the laws of the books within our government, as being a citizen, you have a contract to obey those laws. Or you can understand why that truth is real. You can understand and actually detach from the human story, which is the one that makes you lose that truth at times. At times the trauma and the issues that you had growing up in life are actually the ones that causes you to lose sight of what is real, good, true, constructive, you. So if you don't find it through your life, through the people around you, through your family, find it within yourself. You are that vehicle of consciousness. It's in you. You are that vehicle. Everything you need to know exists inside of you if you just reach in and find it. That's what's so different about human beings. Animals and plants are in it. They don't ask those questions. They don't need to know. They are it. It's the house itself. It's only us that have that fragile state. As we are disconnected from that field, when you send an astronaut to a new planet, you're not going to be able to send immediately the police and the government out there to make sure they do good and right. It has to come from the person itself by understanding who we are and what we are and why we are here. So maybe it's time. Maybe it's time that you know that and understand that. And we're here to help do that. This is why we spend so much time connecting to that knowledge, the inner knowledge of just consciousness, just consciousness itself, before matter, before the human story, and after, infinitely after. So I don't actually know how to even end this video. It's, I don't feel that there's an end to this video. There'll just be continuation in other ones as we dive deeper into the meaning of existence, why there is something instead of nothing. But as we are part of something, let's do it. So thank you very much, and we'll see you soon.